do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. And Lord, we thank you that you're greater than any problems we have, any uh, issues we have in our world, Lord, that uh, the amazing thing is that before you even created us, Lord, that you realized the things that uh, this world would do, the, the, the way the world would reject you and your son. But Lord, you loved us enough to uh, give us that opportunity to love you and accept the free gift that you give to each one of us, Lord. And if there's someone here this morning that does not know you, that has never accepted your free gift of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we just pray that you would speak to them now and draw them to your son and, and that they would respond uh, possibly to that, to your invitation. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that as Christians, Lord, that we do have opportunities to learn and grow from the things that go on in our lives, from, but Lord, most of all from your word and what you teach us, Lord, through uh, your word. And, and Lord, we just thank you that we don't have to go through these things uh, by ourselves. We don't have to try to figure things out, Lord, we'll just follow you. Will. And Lord, just forgive us where we failed you. Just help us each day to uh, be a witness for, to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wanted to introduce you to our, uh, our minister today. He's going to be preaching for us. A lot of you know him, but uh, since it's been several years since he's been here, I uh, probably should be introduced. Kevin Trink is, uh, is the chaplain of Baptist Hospital in, in Orange. And uh, he's been there for a long time. Here, so, uh, of course, since it's been a while since we've been here, I guess it's been a while. So, uh, anyway, he's going to come up and preach. I just want to let you know something. One, we're going to have Children's Church. Ms. Marcy's waiting there, so if anybody would like to go for that, to that Children's Church, it's going to be going on right now. Also, this evening, uh, during the uh, prayer service that we have at 630, we're going to show a video. It's an Operation Christmas Child video, but it's a very unique video. It's about 10 minutes long. We'll be showing it uh, in lieu of a, a sermon, uh, per se. And it's, uh, it's about a fellow from Rwanda and, uh, and the way that God has worked in his life through Operation Christmas Child and with the gospel as well and uh, his story of redemption. So you want to come back and, and watch that because it's really, you, you'll be blessed to know that um, about that young man. And so please come back this evening at 6 and watch that. And Brother Kevin Trick, uh, bring our message. It always makes me nervous when they say it's time to dismiss for children's church. When I'm preaching somewhere, I'll make sure there's no adults uh, sneaking out of there. Because I know sometimes, uh, anyway, some of you got caught that. Some of you did. And I, it is a privilege and honor to be here with you. I think it's been five or six years since I've been here. Uh, I was the chaplain at Baptist Orange Hospital. Now I'm in Beaumont. Transferred back to Beaumont and uh, been with Baptist Hospital for 15 years. And uh, what a privilege and honor it is to be filling in for Brother David. So if you are a visitor here today, make sure you come back next week so you can hear some real preaching. And uh, know that uh, I'm not going to do improve Brother David. I'm just Brother Kevin here today. Also, I wanted to uh, let you know if you're ever at Baptist Hospital and you need some help, feel free to look us up. And uh, if you ever help, need some help navigating health care, let us know. We know the right person to get a hold of if you need prayer. Is it whatever way we can help you at Baptist Hospital, we want to be there for you. I do miss one of your members here, Miss Jesse Perry. <laughs> Last time I was here, Brother Dan, you weren't here, but Miss Jesse Perry reminded me when I was walking through the hallway there. She said, now, Brother Kevin, you know church starts at 1030, right? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, you know it ends at 1045, right? <laughs> so I always tell that on her. I've told, I've told on her many places and many times. But, uh, but anyway, I'm glad to be here with you. Today I'm going to talk about engaging our culture for Christ. Engaging our culture. I don't know about you, but some of the songs we sang mentioned about a broken generation. Uh, I know um, just as Martin Luther made an impact on his culture, he saw some things going on in the church. That you and I know that our culture is having difficulties right now. is having problems in our American culture. And yet, how do we as Christians uh, make a difference and impact our culture? 
I don't know if you've heard about this movie coming out, Star Wars, a Force, Force Awakening of Force, The Force Awakening. Anybody heard of that movie coming out on December the 18th? Yeah, I know that you've had as well. As you know, that's the seventh movie in that particular epic uh, by George Lucas. But did you know that The Force Awakens had sold, has sold more advanced tickets than any movie in history? Another thing about The Force Awakens is that it's reported to sold eight more times tickets than the previous first day record holder, which was The Hunger Games. Also about Star Wars, that the first day, the single day ticket sale record was by a factor of 10. The movie generated already $6.5 million on the first day. And the next closest film was only a million dollars. That gives you some perspective. So why is Star Wars so popular? Why are our, our, our culture, why do we flock to those things like that? Well, writing for Forbes magazine, Scott Middleton says this. He says, George Lucas has created a series specifically for film. Other movie franchises, such as James Bond, Batman, Iron Man, Harry Potter, and all the rest of them, start out as comic books. But George Lucas started this out as, as specifically for film. As a, as a result, Star Wars has struck an original chord in our culture with plot, character, special effects created to maximize the movie theater experience. And you and I know for four decades it has been associated with filmmaking excellence. And yet as you think about Star Wars, Star Wars <coughs> impacts our culture. But yet as we think about Star Wars and we think about our Christian life, how do we create life? How do we, how do we create uh, those things in life? that help us to become better Christians? What are the things that we can do to impact our culture, to impact the lives around us, to, to know that our, our Christianity, the relationship with the Lord, makes so much more difference than, than just a, a movie or theater presentation. As we look at this passage, as you look at the scripture, you and I both know that throughout the Bible we see God's people at times straying off path, going in different directions, even the Lord confronting rebellious types of generations and individuals and peoples. And yet there are still opportunities for you and me to make an impact upon our generation. I don't know about you, but I want to see an impact in our generation. And I want it to be me. I want to make a difference in my life. I want to make a difference in my brief time here on this earth. And I know you do as well. And so how do we make an impact on our culture? What are four ways that we can make an impact? Now, Miss Ann Bennett, this is number, number one in parentheses, so make sure you fill up those sermon notes there. I told her earlier, I said, there's a place for sermon notes in here, and hers better be full, because I'm going to check it after I get done. <clears throat> so what's the first way that we can make an impact for our culture? Number one is pray for spiritual awakening. Pray for spiritual awakening. Now, what's the deal here? Why is spiritual awakening? George Washington. Uh, our founder of our country said this, the nation that forgot God has never been allowed to endure. Amen. And we as a culture, if we forget about God, and you see God being moved out of our culture, you see Him being moved out of all areas of life, and if we forget God, then our nation will not be able to endure. Now what is the difference between spiritual awakening and revival. <coughs> revival basically means you bring something back to life again. Now church, we need a revival in the church. But spiritual awakening is when a lost person, someone who has a lostness in their soul, awake to salvation, to God's design for them, having that relationship with Him. A common passage that you may see many people referring to is 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14 if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Now you notice what the Lord says there. If my people, Henry Blackaby says, I know Henry Blackaby came here a couple of years ago, didn't he? Several years ago. Henry Blackaby says this, that only the people of God can truly shape a nation. Well, if that's true, what are the people of God up to? How are we shaping our nation and you think the way the people of God go, the way the redemption of the world goes. And he says right here, if my people, so guess what church, it's up to you and me to impact the culture. There are lots of things impacting the culture. Some people look to government, the politics. Well, that's a beast to behold, isn't it? Any of y'all carve any Trumpkins lately? Anyway, that's a good one. 
<laughs> I saw that. I saw a picture of Donald Trump carved into a pumpkin. But you think about Washington. If you're looking to Washington for answers, they're so polarized, they can't even get along themselves. What about activists? You see these activists and all these people, they're polarized as well. If you want to look to Hollywood, well, you're going to have a tough time finding godliness in Hollywood. There are some in Hollywood. But you see the films coming out, at least they're getting a picture, I think, with Evangelical, some of the better films coming out, like War Room and some of the other ones coming. But you think about how do we impact our culture? It is you and me, the people of God, who can shape a nation. And we must pray for spiritual awakening. And to look to the Lord for hope and for help. To humble ourselves, to pray, to have a passion for God. Living, loving, being in relationship with Him. Seeking His face, turning from our wicked ways, forgiving, asking forgiveness for our sins. And guess what? Healing will come. Did you know a few years ago, America sent out 127,000 missionary uh, missionaries to other countries? You may know we have a big missionary endeavor out there. But did you also realize that 32,000 missionaries came from other countries to the United States? That's pretty telling, isn't it? That other countries around the world see the need. Did you know there is a fifth great awakening going on? Dan, I appreciate you talking about, uh, about uh, Martin Luther. Give us a little church history there. Polycarp and some of those folks. Um, Anyway, you think about spiritual awakening. David Barrett in his Encyclopedia of Christianity says this, that there is a spiritual awakening going on around the world. It's just not happening in the United States. 82,000 people a day around the world are being saved. Some estimates that 10,000 people in China a day, up to 100,000 a day, are being saved. So you see all this happening around the world, but why not in the United States? They say only 6,000 a day in the United States or North America are being saved compared to the other tens of thousands being saved around the world. Why is that? Philip Yancey, the editor of Christianity Today, has a theory. He says this. He says, God will not go where he's not wanted. God will not go where he's not wanted. What about you? Do you want God in your life? Is he in your heart? Is he resonating with you on a daily basis? Are you looking to him for hope and help? I don't know if you know this as well, but around the world, especially in the Middle East, Muslims are having visions and dreams of Jesus. More Muslims have come to Christ in the last 15 years than the last 15 centuries. It's pretty amazing. I heard about a Muslim named Osama. He was a Muslim fundamentalist that was working in Jahaba al nursha which is an Al-Qaeda of Syria. A Christian began sharing the gospel with this guy, Osama, who was a Muslim fundamentalist. In time, Osama came to Christ. Once he became a Christian, he was seized and brutally tortured by the terror group that he once served. A gentleman named Tom Dole tells the rest of the story about Osama. He said this, the night before his execution, Osama was told uh, that he would be spared if he recanted his faith. In other words, if he denied Christ, he would be spared. He refused. Osama refused. His executioner was so impressed that he instructed Osama, quote, when we blindfold you, when you hear the first shot, hit the ground and do not move. Pretend that you are a dead man. Osama followed his instructions. Minutes later, he opened his eyes and found the men in the firing squad dead and the execution leader gone. Osama is now in a secluded mode. God is at work around the world. And I don't want him just at work around the world. I want him at work here in Orange, Texas. Amen. And in Biden, Texas. And in Bridge City. And in Mauriceville. In Orange County. In Jefferson County. And the state of Texas. The United States of America. Amen. And you and I can make that difference by praying for spiritual awakening. What's the second way that we can impact our culture? The second way is Ephesians 4.15 says this, speak the truth in love. Pretty straightforward, right? That you and I can speak the truth in love. We speak it out of love. We tell others. I don't know if you know this, Brother Dan. Augustine of Hippo. Early church father. I told my son Jeremy this. He's a fifth grader. Augustine of Hippo. He started laughing. He said, who's got a name like Hippo? <laughs> I remember Hippo while playing Hungry Hungry Hippo. Augustine of Hippo, 300 A.D., said this, he said this. He said, wrong is wrong even if everybody's doing it. Right is right even if nobody's doing it. Amen. And you know that's true. And what is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I 
am the truth. And what is truth? It's the scripture. It's a relationship that God wants with you. That He loves you unconditionally. That's the truth. And He wants you to be in right relationship with Him. That's why He sent Jesus to you and me. And the truth is found here in the Bible. You say, people, well, I don't know. I don't believe that book. You probably heard it out there. Well, that's good for them. Nowadays, truth is relative, they say. Well, what works for you? That's the mantra of today. Well, I can take care of myself. Self-reliance and self-independence. All these different things. Well, that's just a bunch of stories. I don't believe it's true. Well, I've never been to Alaska. Okay, I don't believe in Alaska. Is Alaska still true? Absolutely. And you think about speaking the truth in love. Letting folks know what the truth is. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you will be my disciples. And then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So how do you know it's truth? Well, won't you read it? All you got to do is read it. The truth is right here. And yet when we know the truth and we speak the truth, we have to do it in love. We have to do it in unconditional love. If Paul is talking to the Ephesians there, and he's talking about Christian maturity. And as, as a result, we no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of man, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Verse 14. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. In other words, being mature and speaking the truth in love. LaVeta Myers is the grandma who was sitting on the front porch and holding her grandson, Zach. And little Zach was there and he was talking about, he said, Nanny, he said, I love your eyes. Nanny, I love your nose. Nanny, I love your skin. Why, Nanny, I even love your whiskers too. <laughs> now, did that little three-year-old grandson, did he say that out of meanness? You and I both know he said that out of unconditional love. But he spoke the truth. Granny had little whiskers on him. 